Good morning, sweetie. You ready for mama to chaperone you on your first school field trip? This is Brandon Rogers. I'm Flint Dicker and you're watching the f***ing news. This is also Brandon Rogers. In fact, this, this, and this are also Brandon Rogers. Over the course of his YouTube journey, he's played a total of 15 different characters across multiple web series, YouTube channels, and anything else you can possibly imagine. Amassing a total of over 6 million subscribers since he began his channel all the way back in 2006. From being the voice of Blitz in Hell of a Boss to his own menagerie of colorful characters, Brandon is certainly a rather large voice among the comedians of YouTube. Some of you watching this may be asking, well, if he's so talented, why does he only have 6 million subscribers? Well, in mine and many others' opinions, Brandon Rogers should be far more popular than he is right now. So what's going on? Well, the truth is, Brandon is the last surviving specimen of the era of YouTube where it was okay to be non-PC. Let me explain. Do you all remember Filthy Frank? Someone we now know as Joji used to be an insanely popular YouTube personality back in 2014. But it's what made him so immensely influential that is also what brought him down. Filthy Frank was extremely out there in terms of his comedic style. This man had absolutely no filter at all. It did not matter how much in poor taste his jokes were, nor how insanely offensive they were, Filthy Frank would do it and people loved him for it. It was also during this time that other YouTubers would recognize the success and social media impact of Filthy Frank and follow in his footsteps. There were a surprising amount of YouTubers who jacked this trend. We got iDubs TV, Max Mofo, Anything for Views, all of which worked with Frank to film sketches. But there was one person who most people don't realize carved the path that Filthy Frank walked. Brandon Rogers. So what's the big deal? Well, having such an out there style of comedy doesn't exactly fly in today's YouTube climate. All but one of those channels I mentioned is now just disappeared or changed their style of content entirely. All but one. You guessed it. It's Brandon. And while everyone else in this little section of YouTube comedy left, he stayed and perfected his style of comedy. His skits are just as, or sometimes even more out there than Filthy Frank and anyone else really. But Brandon has two things going for him that the other channels mentioned previously didn't have. And that is a combination of incredibly high production value with a team of extremely talented actors, comedians, writers, and cameramen, and fantastic storytelling. Because Brandon's videos aren't just funny, they're connected. Connected to a gigantic universe where every character has an arc, every character is fleshed out front to back, and every character has a purpose other than just comic relief. So, without further ado, let's dive in to the many faces of Brandon Rogers. There are three things we are going to cover in this video. Two entire web series and one singular skit, all of which have a shockingly complex overarching story between them. The first series is titled Stuff and Sam, and it follows Sam, a regular guy just trying to become a father. The second is Blame the Hero, the story of a thug who tries to save the world by going back in time. And the third is a singular skit called A Day at the Beach, and is the glue that connects both series together. Let's start with Stuff and Sam. Totaling 20 entire episodes, Stuff and Sam begins as a pretty bare-bones sitcom starring a guy named Sam and his roommate Donna Fitz. For those of you who are or were fans of Brandon, you should already know who Donna is. In the second episode of the show, the main conflict is introduced, being that Sam wants to adopt a baby and become the father he's always dreamed of becoming. However, this is harder than it looks, as he needs to convince Helen, a representative from the local adoption agency, that he's fit for fatherhood. Helen explains that Sam needs a public figure to come on your show and endorse you as a good parent before he can adopt a child. So Sam sets off to find someone who's willing to admit that this guy would be a suitable father figure. Now I'm going to be honest here, most of the show is pure filler with not a whole lot of the main plot going on. Sam celebrates Halloween, Christmas, 4th of July, the whole nine yards. And it's not really until episode 12 where things really get going. Sam and Donna appear on the classic therapy show where one Dr. Dini helps Sam and Donna to become better foster parents towards a fake baby. Look, I, I don't know, man. 
But it's in this episode where Dr. Dini finally gives Sam the endorsement he was looking for. I said you're such a good dad. Daddy on duty. Daddy. You need a public figure to endorse He's you. Such a good dad, 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 dad. So it's back to the adoption agency. However, before that, we need to talk about the very next episode titled How I Met Donna. Up until this point, Donna has just been the grumpy old lady that Sam just hangs around with. She hasn't exactly been explained, nor has her character been really fleshed out all that much. But in this episode, we learn all about Sam and Donna's relationship. You see, Sam was an orphan, and when he was 17, he was adopted by Donna. But not before meeting another very strange character. Damien, meet Sam. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Why, yes, that is Onision. And yes, this clip did age like fine wine. Anyway, after being disciplined by Donna, on I mean Damien, shows up and knocks her out with a toilet paper roll, causing her to lose her memory. Sam tries everything to jog her memory, but the only thing that seems to do the trick is dyeing his hair blonde. It's a perfect representation of the son that Donna used to have. Besides, I already had a son once. <laughs> What was he like? He was beautiful. Just seeing his blonde little head in the morning sun was all I needed to start my day. Well, sounds like a great kid. <laughs> Nobody sticks around forever, Sam. She still doesn't really remember who she is, but she understands and cares more about Sam now for some reason. With the public endorsement in hand, Sam returns to the adoption agency to finally pick up his baby. This is where we are introduced to my favorite character in the Brandon Rogers universe, Bryce Tankthrust, better known as the CEO, an evil and literally heartless woman who does everything she can to deter Sam from receiving a child. So Sam is forced to once again return home empty-handed, but not before Elmer, one of the employees working at the agency, sends him a message. The next episode begins with Sam and Donna under attack from clown assassins. On the count of three, I'm gonna throw this bag over his head, okay? All right. One, two, three. I got him! I got him! I got him! I'm the one that got him! Ripping off the mask reveals that it was Elmer the whole time? Wait, no, 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 it's a different Elmer. How many Elmers are there? Is that a baby? It is, and it has nothing to do with you except everything. Now I'm gonna need to run a few tests. She kept the original, prolonging its youth to clone God knows how many of us by now. And that baby could be well in its 40s for all I know. You see, the baby that Sam has been after this whole show is being used by Bryce to clone Elmer hundreds and hundreds of times. It's also here where we really see just how amazing Brandon Rogers' storytelling truly is. Every single Elmer ever mentioned in a Brandon Rogers skit have all been from this baby. It's such an amazing reveal. I mean, this is a character that we've seen in A Day at the Park, I, like every grandpa video. He's everywhere and he's just kind of always been that like emotionless employee stereotype. But now we have an actual canonical reason for why he's the emotionless employee type. So Sam, Donna, and Elmer number 70 million or whatever, go back to the adoption agency to rescue the baby and call it happily ever after. Spoiler alert, they do that. They actually they actually do that. There's there's not really a big twist here. However, once Sam finally has the baby, where does he go from here? Well, the answer is not very far, as Bryce is somehow still alive after having her heart stolen. Her actual heart. And at one point in this scene, she knocks Donna out. I don't know why, but <laughs> she does. <laughs> and when she eventually comes to, her memory is back. And she realizes that the baby she and Sam had been trying to get all along was her baby that wasn't dead but stolen by Bryce. Yeah, you know this scene? Just seeing his blonde little head in the morning sun was all I needed to start my day. That's Elmer. Elmer is her son. So she kills Bryce, or rather the baby kills Bryce, and she kicks Sam and the camera crew out of the house forever, and now Sam is left alone to pick up the pieces of his television show. And by picking up the pieces, 
I mean canceling. So Sam and the crew set off into the depths of LA to find the TV30 headquarters. And it's here where the show really begins to go left field. In the second to last episode, we meet face to face with Brandon Rogers himself the creator. Brandon explains that everything I've ever written has come from these pages. Everything you know or want or love or desire came into existence via this book. Anything written within its pages will become true, including... Uh, no, 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 Sam, you gotta be specific! Oh my word! Oh my word! Oh. Well, he's already dead, and uh, that's it. That's pretty much for Stuff and Sam. There's really not anything else of no- So you must be the oldest Emer alive. I was the first clone 40-something years ago, yes. Sam tries to tie everything off in a really nice bow, and that's just it. That is, until- Following the ending of Stuff and Sam, we meet our friends on a lovely day at Venice Beach. I don't think this is working out. I'm sorry, Principal Morris, but I believe you have your head in your ass. You just, you just, you just can't escape it, can you? Just like, yeah. Anyway, our friends have found themselves in the midst of a time machine who keep managing to mess with the time-space continuum. Eventually, it lands into the hands of the... Oh, do I really have to read this name out loud, bro? Okay. <clears throat> Eventually, it lands into the hands of the Mingeworthies. <laughs> Two extremely British characters who decide to go back to the Wild West for some reason. However, they lose the time machine and end up getting trapped there. It's also here where we see a young Blame. Oh, yeah, by the way, there's a gangster dude named Blame. Uh,. Just ignore him, he's kind of a small character, who's simply trying to get his tattoo changed, and Donna finally finding love in George, aka Grandpa, you know, that Grandpa, you know, you know, that, oh, yeah, yeah, that Grandpa? Something just popped! <clears throat> yeah. Other than that, A Day at the Beach is just your average Brandon Rogers skit with all of our favorite characters. Surely nothing can go wrong, and we can continue to enjoy more harmless, not- The last thing that we need to talk about today is a series called Blame the Hero. No, no, not Blame the Hero. It's more like Blame... Okay, whatever. Remember this guy? This is Blame. Just your average thug looking for a good time. We begin our show in the year 2033, just after the events of A Day at the Beach. In this timeline, the United States never had the democracy we oh so cherish and the United States of America became the United States of Britain, a country founded by the two Brits who grabbed the time machine and got sent back to the year 1865, and also a nuke went off. So long! <laughs> Remember Elmer? Not this Elmer, nor this Elmer, but THE Elmer. He founded his own secret society after Sam gave him Brandon's book! <clears throat> now, you're probably thinking, Ghost, you forgot to mention that during the Stuff and Sam bit of this video, and you would be 100% right, but I'm already asking you guys to remember way too many small details, so I might as well spring this on you now, as to not cause too much confusion? <clears throat> which uh, you can't avoid with this guy. Elmer explains that the nuke we just saw was caused by a guy named Bobby Worst, and his goal was to nuke the planet, causing everyone affected by the blast to become the worst versions of themselves. Needless to say, he succeeded in creating the apocalypse, and now Elmer informs Blame that he needs to use the time machine found in A Day at the Beach to go back to 1865 and stop the Mingeworthies from creating the United States of Britain, therefore stopping Bobby Worst from creating the apocalypse. Seems pretty simple enough, right? Well, to get the time machine back from the cafe where Blame was kidnapped, he's going to need a little help. What better a person to bring along as leverage than the one person Bobby hates more than anyone else? Well, well, look who needs who now. I'll take a triple half-sweet knockback caramel macchiato and let's start talking. And speaking of Bryce, let's answer the question of why she specifically needed to accompany Blame on his quest for the time machine. Well, the third episode begins with Bobby's backstory. A child whose father hates him so much he forces him to drive. <laughs> 
<laughs> Yikes. Anyway, Bobby is bullied relentlessly by the other kids in his kindergarten class. I mean, they just hate this kid. I mean, even his father hates him, who also happens to teach the class. Look, just go with it, okay? Just go with it. Everyone's making fun of him until none other than Bryce steps in and puts a stop to it. And just like that, a beautiful friendship was born. And when one kid asks another to be his girlfriend by bestowing upon her a gift of unmatched value and beauty, Bryce believes it's her duty to one-up him. So she gets on one knee and gives Bobby her own actual human heart. Like she, she rips her heart out of her body and gives it to Bobby. How is she alive? How is she living? What is happening, bro? This naturally causes Bobby to do the only thing any logical person would do. Puke his guts out, upsetting Bryce so much to the point where she leaves Bobby and Bobby gets thrown in jail, I guess. I mean, Bryce technically killed the dude and then everyone blamed it on Bobby even though they saw Bryce kill him. And, uh, you know, whatever. Anyway, 20 years pass and Bobby breaks out of prison. He makes a deal with the leaders of the United States of Britain. Pay me seven trillion in every currency and I will nuke the planet. Did this drag queen just say and? He did say and, your majesty. So this bitch wants us to pay her, then she's gonna nuke us? He's not giving us a fucking option. <sighs> really? So back to blame. They eventually do find the time machine, but uh oh, guess who's back? It's Bobby. This is the first time that Bobby and Bryce have seen each other since Bobby was thrown in prison, and he's not exactly happy about it. You call yourself evil. You couldn't even kill me, and I'm a fucking terrorist. <laughs> You're right. I just need a little push. I could go into the details about what makes this one particular scene so good, but I really don't need to, and I don't really, I don't think I should. You just gotta go watch it for yourself. Well, now Blame is in the past, and he has to go and track down the Mingeworthies and stop them from seizing hold of the US government. Unfortunately, we learn it's already too late for Blame, as the Mingeworthies have already taken control of the country. It's also revealed that apparently they knew Blame was coming and set a bounty on his head. So Blame goes back in time again to kill the Mingeworthies as they're about to take control. Freeze time, f***ers! Hey, hey you. you! I'm an American hero, dog. I said, Blame goes back in time again to kill the Mingeworthies as they're about to take control. Hello again, dogs. Hey, hey, yeah. There we go. Now with his mission complete, Blame returns to the future. And look, no apocalypse. Crisis of Ver- Just kidding. Ah, Blame. Now it's time for my apocalypse. Wait, what? Haha, <laughs> -ha, yes, that's right. It was me, Elmo, the whole time. While you were killing the British people, I was making a bomb that would turn everyone and everything into me. Isn't that something special? <laughs> Well, crap. Now we have to go back in time and stop whoever made the time machine in the first place from even making it. It is done! My time machine is finally complete! Adolf f***ing Hitler? Of course! Adolf Hitler made the time machine. This series, man, it never ceases to amaze me. So now, Blame has to go and kill Hitler, and also Elmer to some degree, and also destroy the time machine. Look, I know this is getting insane now, so I'm just gonna speed through it and get to the real juicy bits, okay? Long story short, Blame teams up with some spies that have names so good that I won't tell them to you. Well, we use code names until the war's over. I'm Lima Dozen, a sexy spy with an hour to kill. And this is our medic, Hungry Bitch. I'm always fat and I'm always a bitch. <laughs> After getting some secondhand weed smoke, Blame and the gang don't kill Hitler. No, they, because why Why would they, you know? I mean, why, why would they solve the problem? You know what I'm saying? No, because of course there's a huge unaccounted fight where Adolf Hitler and Abraham Lincoln steal and then break the time machine and get sent 
to the future. In fact, the exact time and place where Bryce was about to give Bobby her actual heart. Obviously, if two extremely polarizing historical figures popped into existence in front of you, you would be surprised too. And so they kill Hitler. <clears throat> Which, uh, by the way, was Bobby's grandfather? Little Blitzbin? I changed my name to Coach Best. This is who I am now. We what a twist! Wow. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree after all. Back in World War II, Blame and Elmer have one final battle, where Elmer actually manages to kill Blame, but not before getting stabbed himself with a poisoned knife. And I mean, in the words of every character who's mentioned it, Why would you poison a knife if you're stabbing someone? Ugh. And then, it ends. That's the end of the show, but we're not quite done. What's your name, by the way? My name? Well, now that the war's over, we don't need code names anymore. I'm Skinny Bitch, and you are? I'm Donna. Donna Fitz. Which opens up a huge ass can of worms that I don't even want to talk about right now. And another thing is that in the future, the correct timeline that is, being the one that Blame have saved and the one where Donna and George, aka Grandpa, are happily married, it's revealed in one final scene, the last few frames of the final episode, that Grandpa is Blame. And, you know, Sam is dead, uh, he ate an egg or something, I don't know. But he also still managed to change Blame's tattoo, somehow giving him the exact same one that he wanted to get rid of in the first place. I don't know how he did that. Is Sam in a gang? Is this like, is this gang activity? Is he in a gang? Okay, have such a satisfying ending for a show as goofy as Blame the Hero? And for as goofy as Brandon's channel is in general, it's nice to see that he's taking the time and effort to not just make us laugh, but also to make us think. And appreciate that behind every insane out there skit, there's a story. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Peace.